Hello, everyone. Um, welcome again to another SON uh, SFP series talk. Uh, today, we are uh, honored to have Dr. Charles Hillman with us, um, who is an AFP, um, uh, on the topic of critical appraisal of a paper. So um, I'll hand you over to Dr. Hillman. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, so I was asked to do this presentation, critical appraisal of the paper. Um, I'm hoping because it's quite a small audience, we can get um, some good um, engagement. So um, I know, you know, just only just coming out of being a student not too long ago, I know how easy it is to turn off the cameras and get on with other stuff while watching it. But um, if you want to turn your cameras on, feel free. It's always nice uh, talking to faces rather than blank screens. Um, but I encourage you to get involved and um, if you can, and we can go through it and it just makes it all a bit exciting for everyone. OK, so today what we're going to do, we're going to talk about PICO, a classic kind of acronym for um, talking about research studies and then building our confidence in critically appraising primary research. And we'll do so with an example paper, which hopefully should have been sent out to you. Um, but if not, I've got a little QR code when we get to it where you can access it from the video. OK, so let's crack on. So before we start talking about um, critically appraising paper, we've got to think about why are we doing this? What is the point? Is it just for an interview to kind of show that you know what research is or you know wh why are we doing it? Um, so some key ways that I like to think about why we bother doing it is peer review. So we look at papers, we look at how research is done and we poke holes in it. We say that could have been done better. That's not great. Um, does this really answer the question I want to ask? Or does it answer the question you're trying to ask yourselves? Um, so it's a way that we can make sure that the evident, the research that we put out is of good evidence um, if we're testing each other on it and we're sort of saying, mm, that's not so good, that could be done better. So that's a really important part of evidence-based medicine is peer review. And that comes from critically appraising the research that is put out, but also to inform clinical practice. So say um, I have some patient with some really strange, weird condition, I want to know if this new treatment is going to make a difference to that patient um, and say they are of a specific age range and you know there's no there's no clinical guidance so far on this it's something rare you can look to research papers and you can look okay this patient kind of fits the demographic of the patients that were studied in this research article saying that this was effective therefore if i you know if i agree with the findings of the paper and i think it's a good research paper i think it it's you know it's valid then I can say, right, okay, I think I'm gonna apply this knowledge from this paper into what I'm doing with this patient, with the patient that I've got in situ. So it's very important to be able to read the paper and decide if it makes sense to what you're trying to solve with your own questions in clinical practice. And lastly, to inform further research. So you can read an article, you can decide that, okay, this makes sense, but this also raises more questions for me. Um, and that can then, be a sort of jumping point to say that, okay, I'm gonna conduct research based on this one. Um, and I'm gonna hopefully kind of follow it up and continue the line to find out more, to again, further improve clinical practice. So that's the main kind of reasons why we bother critically appraising papers. Um, and it's a uh, necessary evil, I guess, of um, anyone from academics to just normal clinicians that aren't even involved in research. Okay, so, First of all, we've got to think, what is the question? So um, this is my first step of kind of critically appraising things. And to do this, um, there is a lovely acronym called PICO. Now, does anyone know what PICO stands for? Don't be afraid, I won't bite. Is that P for population? Yeah, that's one. We got one down, three to go. Any guesses? I is uh, intervention. Yes, I is for intervention. Some, some is put in the chat. Yes, uh... Oh, let's see if I can see that. I can see, yeah, there we go. Thanks, Ed. Go. Population intervention control and outcome or comparison and outcome um, <laughs> is a bit more apt because you're not always going to get a control in some studies. Um, yes, so basically we're using this kind of summary to answer, does this paper ask the question I'm asking? asking sorry. So if I've got a 30 year old woman who has got 
rheumatoid arthritis and I want to know if this new medicine is better than the best standard treatment um, to treat her rheumatoid arthritis, I will look and I'll look for a paper that's got the population that fits my 30 year old female in it. That's testing this new drug with intervention. That's got a comparison. So ideally I'd want it to be the best standard treatment that is available at the moment and see, for instance, does it improve um, patient reported outcomes or um, does it improve stiffness, for instance? So that's kind of summarizing the question that I'm answer asking. And then I apply this to the research paper and say, does this paper answer the question that I want to know? Um, and so when we're putting it into perspective, so we get, had that rheumatoid arthritis kind of example, but for instance, this is an example of something. So the population could be British males ages 18 to 50. It could be the intervention is a vasectomy. Comparison, none. Um, and you want to see if they get testicular cancer in 10 years. That's your outcome measure. So ignoring the title of a research paper, because they can sometimes be misleading. This is the real question of the paper. And this is the first thing you want to kind of do when you look at a paper. What exactly is it trying to find out? And in what kind of people? And what's it comparing it to? OK, so um, that's our first step. And at, after we've gone through all of the steps, we're going to apply it to the research paper that I sent. So moving on next, we want to think of the types of study design. Um, so we want to look where in the hierarchy of evidence does this paper sit? You know, what, what's, the, what's the design of it? So does anyone know, say, in, in terms of primary research, what is the gold standard of study design that we could be using? Any guesses? No, nope. okay, that's fine. So um, top of our kind of pyramid of primary research is randomized controlled trials, which I'm sure everyone's heard about. And then we have on top of that kind of systematic reviews, meta-analyses, et cetera. Um, but we have this hierarchy of evidence, as you guys can see here. So our RCTs are kind of the best, but you don't always have them. And you have cohort studies, case control, et cetera, case reports. Um, and each of them, as you go down, are low quality and you're more likely to have bias in them. So that's why we look for that kind of peak to inform our proper clinical practice. And so the best you can find really is a meta-analysis, but um, you kind of go down the list if you can't find your answer with each of the kind of higher up ones. Um, so we're mainly going to talk today about randomized control trials um, because that is kind of the as I say, the gold standard, um, most commonly the ones that you will be appraising as well. Um, but there are tons of others and there are slightly different ways that you appraise the different kinds of other ones. Um, but a lot of things that we'll go through today are applicable to your other kind of types of research. OK, so then once we've decided what the study design is, um, so say, for instance, as a randomized control trial, then we can then look at the methodology. So your first thing that you want to look for is you want to make sure that consent has been gained by the participants and there's ethical approval. Um, it's, it might seem unlikely that a, a study can be published without ethical approval, um, but you know maybe some way back in the day from, I don't know, early 1900s when it wasn't so mandatory, um, these things might not have happened. And so it's um, important to always look at that before you start analyzing the data. Next, we move on to our participants. So we want to know things about their demographics um, because, you know, say you're looking into, uh, I don't know, mortality after a certain treatment or something like that. Obviously someone who's very, very old is gonna have less of a life expectancy generally than um, someone who's younger. And so if you're looking at who survives after 20 years uh, after a treatment, then obviously there's gonna be bias for the older people. Um, or the more frail people. So you want to look at demographics, you want to look at how they were recruited. So if, um, I don't know, if, if you're looking for people who, uh, you're looking how many people, for instance, are physically active in um, the UK or something like that, and you only place the advertisements for the study on, in a, like a fitness magazine, for instance, then obviously you're gonna get bias from there. You're gonna get the people that actually sign on to the study. You want to look how many people are recruited that's obviously very important. If you have two people in a study, um, then the findings aren't going to be very significant and very applicable for other people. But if you have thousands of people in a study, then you know that um, at least there's, you'll, you know, some 
if you see a change and a significant improvement in whatever, then you know that that might be quite significant and applicable. And the inclusion and exclusion criteria, this kind of fits into the demographics, but you want to look that enough of the uh, variables on these people have been controlled for, um, and that, you know, you're looking about a chance of getting a heart attack in 10 years in a random group of people. Well, if they've had multiple heart attacks before, then they're more likely to have another one. So you want to make sure they've got strict inclusion exclusion criteria that help them answer the question. Next, we move on to randomization. So this is obviously only really applicable in randomized controlled trials, but you want them to have reported how they've randomized people. Because if they've said they've randomized people, they've not really said how, who's to know that they haven't been just someone saying, I think this one should be in arm one. I think this person should be in arm two because, I don't know, they have short hair, they have long hair. Let's just throw them into something. So we want very clear protocols of how things have been randomized. And we want to make sure that um, they kind of check this and they've, they've seen that the demographics of group A and group B um, aren't like wildly dissimilar because obviously then it's improper randomization. But they're kind of fairly equal. OK. And next we move on to blinding. So obviously not every experiment is blinded. Um, you can have single blind, blinded studies, you can have double blinded studies. Um, so you want to make sure that um, you know what it is, because it could just say a blinded controlled, randomized controlled trial, and you wouldn't know if it's single or double. And obviously double is the best when the um, sort of the people conducting the study and the participants don't know what intervention is being received and who's getting it. Um, so that's a very important one. And then we look at the protocol. So this is very specific to the different kind of studies that you're looking at. Um, it requires a bit, sometimes a bit of inside knowledge into um, the condition or into the treatment. But it's basically making sure that everything is very clearly laid out and they've tried to control for as many variables as possible. And this brings us on to the issue potentially of internal versus external validity. Does anyone know what the difference between the two is? Any guesses, guys? Go on, Jerry. You're muted. Go for it. Yeah, so I was thinking external validity is to see how well we can use the result of this finding and apply it to other settings. Mm -hmm. If I'm correct, and internal validity yep. is how the um, how it means just how we can apply to similar settings again. S kind of. So, so you external validity, bang on, but internal validity might might be what you're getting at. But the way I'd use to describe it is um, how well are we answering the question that we're asking essentially. So, if we're saying does A lead to B, um, regardless of everything else, just if you strip it down to A equals b what well, a plus b equals c for instance um then it's basically how well are we answering that question and if we strip everything else away from it so it's for instance saying if you had a person taking statins every single day and exactly the way mm -hmm. they should with a perfect physiology it's like how well does that prevent um an mi for instance versus in real life with people who don't always take their medicines Mm -hmm. uh with people that you know don't always take them at the right time with people that have different physiologies how well do they actually work in the grand scheme of things so that's our external validity and the first one's our internal validity mm -hmm. so often we like to start with studies that have very high internal validity because we want to make sure that a plus b equals c but then we want to see actually in the real world does it really work so um so it's always that kind of balance that you want between the two, because the more real life you make it, the less internal validity it has, because obviously real life isn't perfect. Um, so that's our protocol. And in our protocol, we also want to think about um, any control that there is or any placebo and how well that is. And that kind of works into our blinding as well, if it's a placebo and it's supposed to look exactly the same as our intervention. So we want a clear description of that as well. And lastly, we want to look at the measures. So we want to see, you know, the outcomes. So say they, they're looking about, um, you know, MI, like a chance of getting an MI in the future. How are they looking into that? How are they measuring that? Are they looking through hospital records? Are they using 
self-reported outcomes, um, you know, objective versus subjective measures. Um, if they're using a survey, has that survey been validated to look what they're, to see what they're looking for? Or has the researcher just come up with a bunch of questions um, and they think it's gonna work and they haven't really said why they think it's gonna work. So those are all kind of things you need to be thinking about really. Um, so an example of the subjective versus objective methods is, for instance, with a skin lesion. Skin lesions are often uh, very difficult to really get objectively, like saying, has this improved the skin lesion, this, this cream or this treatment? Um, and so saying that, you know, uh, one researcher evaluated if it's got better or not, that's not very um, objective, really, because it's one person. If they say they got five researchers who all went to trek under underwent a training course in um, rating skin lesions and they used a verified scale um, and they took photos and then counted the number of lesions or whatever. That's all more of a clear description of something that's a bit more objective, a bit more standardized. So that's always something you need to be looking for with that. So it's really kind of digging down. And as I said, in some, um, some fields, it might take a bit of expert opinion to say that's the best way to measure that or that's a bad way to measure that. So that's always sometimes a bit of a tricky area. So moving on, then have critiquing the statistics. So does anyone know what intention to treat means or per protocol means? Any ideas? This is often somewhere, some, an area where people can get a bit tripped up. And often a, a nice way for interviewers to kind of test you. So it, per protocol will be only including the, the kind of patients who go through the treatment kind of completely as, as prescribed and, and get to the end, whereas intention to treat is um, kind of more realistic and kind of takes into account everyone, no matter kind of whether they've been kind of taking the, the drug or whatever, kind of absolutely rigidly or, or kind of other things have got in the way? Yeah, yeah, bang on. So per protocol is, as you said, if everyone does it as exactly they're supposed to, um, and therefore has a higher internal validity, but lower external validity. And then our intention to treat is once you're randomized or assigned a group, then you're included in the analysis. So this is all about how we come up with our final result and our final findings of the study. Um, so intention to treat has much more external validity in that aspect. So very good, Ed. Um, and then we move on to power calculations. So this is um, complex kind of statistical analysis that they use to find out if, what is the ideal sample size um, to um, basically say that their findings are significant. And this will be different based on the different questions that they have. Um, and there should be evidence that they've done this power calculation. So usually they want to say that at least um, if they have X number of participants, then that's 80% likely that the finding is significant. Um, and they'll state the number of participants that's needed. And then you can say if they managed to recruit maybe a thousand participants and their power calculation said that they need a thousand participants, then they're, you know, they've reached that kind of target. But then if you look later and you see that actually they were going via the per, per protocol analysis and only the data of maybe 800 were analyzed, then they haven't really met their power calculation. And therefore, if they make any conclusions that this is significant, it's probably not. And they've kind of shot themselves in the foot there. Um, so that's another thing you need to look at. And then the p-value. So does anyone know what a p-value means or what, what a p-value is used for? No, okay. So a p-value is, um, it's actually on, on my next slide. I can get up here. So this is basically explaining how likely is this result that's come up likely due to chance. So um, basically almost like out of thin air really, this mystical value of 0 0.05 has been used as the standard across lots of research. And it's basically saying that it's 95% likely that this result is not due to chance. So anything under that is obviously high, as you can see. So um, say it's 0 0.001, then it's 99.9% .9 likely. So the lower the p-value is, 
the more likely the result is significant and not due to chance. OK, so you'll only get, really get p-values between 0 and 1. And this isn't going to be a big talk about statistics because I am no expert on statistics, but it's good to have a little bit of knowledge and a bit of um, awareness of these things because um, you need them to really interpret how confident you are about the results of the paper. So again, as I said, not a no statistician, but you've also got a whole load of different statistics terms. So these are experimental event rates, uh, control event rate, risk reduction, absolute risk reduction, relative risk reduction, um, odds of outcome, odds ratio, confidence interval, intervals, number needed to treat. These are all things that are commonly used across research papers. And kind of the big ones to really look out for here are your confidence intervals and the number needed to treat and maybe your odds ratios as well, because they will um, be able to help you if you understand how these are calculated, they'll be able to help you with understanding then once they present you with the results, whether this is actually going to make a difference to your patients. Um, so an, an example is the number needed to treat. Does anyone know what that is? Any guesses? You get extra points if you know how it's worked out as well. So basically, the number needed to treat is the amount of people that we need to give this treatment to for it to actually give the benefit that we want. So um, say that we're saying um, if, I don't know, if, if dexamethasone um, leads to survival after 10 years with COVID or something like that, uh, something strange like that, um, it's basically saying how many people do we need to give dexamethasone to that they will survive more than 10 years? And obviously we want the number needed to treat being, we want it to ideally be one. Um, so everyone who gets it will survive. Um, but it's not always that case. And it's that's very useful in kind of cost benefit analysis and you know strengths and benefit analysis, because if it's a very high number needed to treat, if we have to treat like a, a million people for one person to get a benefit, and it's a very expensive treatment or it comes with a lot of side effects, then we need to think about whether it's worthwhile. So that's quite an interest in, important one. And also confidence intervals. Um, so we'll go on to them a bit in a bit, but it is important in your own time to look into some of these terms. So they frequently come up on papers. Um, and I think in, in some interviews, sometimes they like to ask you to work out some of them as well. Um, so it's important to know. Um, but as I said, this is not going to be a st statistics lecture. So um, we'll talk about confidence intervals after this one. But then we look about critiquing the results. So often this is the part where people glaze over, they skip to the, the discussion where everything's summarized, but you want to actually look at this. You want to see how all the outcomes that they've reported as the, you know, the primary outcomes and the secondary outcomes, have they been, all been reported or are they missing some things? Are they choosing not to talk about certain things? Um, are the subject demographics reported as well? Um, so you want to see it clearly so you can say, ah, oh, these groups are well balanced. And what are the confidence intervals? What are the p-values of the things that they're reporting? Um, are, you know, do, are the p-values less than 0 0.05 if they're saying that this is significant? Are the confidence intervals humongous um, and not really relevant and then kind of negate your significance of your value? Um, and did any participants drop out? Were they lost to follow up? Um, you know, were they, I don't know, were they, did they not get included in, in the analysis and why? And therefore, does this, as I said before, have an impact on your um, power? calculation. So these are all important things you need to ask yourselves when you're looking through the results. And then we move forward and we're asking then about our confidence intervals. So brief summary of what this is, it's basically saying you're 95% likely to have the real true value of this, the answer to this question between these two values. Um, so they'll give an upper limit and a lower limit. Um, this is most important, especially when you're thinking about things like odds ratios. Um, or if you're thinking about risk reduction, for instance. Um, so the thing with odds ratio, if the odds ratio is one, then giving them this medicine, for instance, is not going to give them an improvement. OK, because that's like it's neither going to give them improvement or benefit. But for instance, if your confidence interval, if you're say your mean is just above one, then you might think, ah, oh, it does provide a benefit. But if your confidence intervals are below and also above one, then you have to question actually, is this really significant there? So it's very important to also look at these things. But as I said, I'm not going to go into too much detail because we're not going to talk about stats specifically. 
So the last thing we want to do is we want to critique our discussion. Are they saying that, for instance, their primary outcome measure that wasn't significant, but maybe some of the secondary outcome measures, they had a p-value that was close to 0 0.05, you want exactly or lower. Um, are they basically then overplaying this and kind of saying that this is this is great, this is amazing, even though it wasn't significant? You want to really question that. Have they reported the limitations? Have they, you know, have you come up with about a hundred more limitations than they've actually said and acknowledged in their paper uh, that are significant? Um, and are therefore through all of this their conclusions valid? Um, you know, did they have also insignificant results? Did they have lots of limitations anyway? They're still saying that you know this is the cure to the to cancer, for instance. Um, you want to really ask that because if they are overplaying things, then you want to find out why, and therefore that will implement it affect how you're going to take this further into your own research or into your own, your own practice. And lastly, we want to think about kind of in this area of discussion and conclusions any conflicts of interest. Uh, so these things like uh, being sponsored by a pharmaceutical company or um, they just so happen to be the boss of this um, company that's made this device that will, I don't know, help patients mobilize the disabled. Or, you know, once upon a time they received a grant from um, someone to conduct this research or, you know, it's quite common with things like, for instance, smoking, the tobacco industry and um, sugar and, you know, soft drinks industries and things like that. Um, you want to see that first, because obviously that will sway um, the researchers bias towards the results. OK, so lastly, then we want to summarize. We want to think about what are the strengths and limitations of this paper um, and think about it in our head and therefore take that forward. Say, will it actually change my practice? This is, I think, the most common question people get asked when they're critically appraising a paper. At the end of the day, you've come up with all of this. You know, you've looked through it all. Is it actually going to change anything you do and why? Um, so that's the main question we want to know from taking this paper. And lastly, is there anything else you want to know? So um, has this research paper raised questions? If it's not going to change your practice, why is it? What, what would you want to know that will make you change your practice? Um, and so that's kind of the end of the steps. But lastly, we're going to do a quick bonus round before we take it practically. We do kind of a whistle stop tour through a, um, a real paper. So we're going to look at some graphs. So in the paper I've given you, there aren't really that many charts or anything, but you often get different charts and papers and you are supposed to know what they are and what they mean. So I'm going to give you a chart and I'd like someone to tell me what it is and what it means. So this one, we've got two of them side by side. Anyone know what this one's called? Any guesses? Is it a forest plot? Correct, yes, this is a forest plot. Do you know what kind of studies these mainly are used for or papers they're used for, type of paper? Uh, so if you've done a meta-analysis? Correct, very good. So these are basically to tell us, taking into account all of these studies, how well are they gonna answer the question of this meta-analysis um, and taking into all of their results. So we can see on this, one, we've got one on the left. I think you can probably see my mouse. Um, all the different studies we have in the center, that's probably around our mean of the result. And these are confidence intervals either side. Um, so they're kind of sometimes called a dot and whisker plot as well. Um, I've once seen them called a blobogram as well. Um, so this one's a bit different from the one on the right. Um, the one on the right, we've got different sized um, little uh, boxes. And they're sometimes used to describe, you know, how how important those results are. So maybe these ones will have, will have more participants than some of the others. So therefore the effect of it is kind of bigger. Um, and then at the end, you usually get this kind of summary line um, where it's basically sitting. But the important thing about this is what I said about confidence intervals before, our odds ratio. So if, for instance, if we have this one, which is the mean is over the odds ratio of one, it shows its benefit. But then we've got this, this confidence interval that's way below one then we can't really be sure that this one is showing, showing an overall kind of benefit because it's 95% sure that's between these lines, the real result. So that's why we like to add them all up. This one's not got a summary one, but this one does, which shows that our odds ratio is just above two, which is pretty good. So yes, this is a forest plot and it's a nice way to summarize data from different studies. Next type, anyone know what this one's called? Do 
Okay, this one's a bit more of a tough one. This one's a Kaplan-Meier curve or a Kaplan-Meier plot or chart. And it's basically saying, um, it's a, sometimes also called like a survival chart, survival plot, survival curve. And it's, um, you can test the different interventions or it can be just one intervention. And you're looking along the line after maybe 15 days, what, what's your percentage survival with this intervention? So we can see often maybe if, if you're looking for after maybe just 11 days, you have 50% survival with the control, for instance, in this one. Um, and the interesting thing about these is they, again, useful for predicting survival, but they're less useful the further away you get um, for predicting it because your sample size decreases if people are dying or participants or cells are dying, um, depending on what you're doing. Um, so they're quite useful for this kind of end of things. They're a bit less reliable for this end of things. And they sometimes also can be used to reflect participant dropouts or um, different things as well, but generally they're used for survival. Um, yeah. So for instance, here, you'll if, if you have 100 participants by this point, you'll have, uh, maybe that's around 40 participants. So how much this informs you further is much less reliable than when you had 100 participants. Um, and our last one, does anyone know what this diagram is called? Is that a Prisma flowchart? Correct, very good. So this is used in systematic reviews or uh, literature reviews, meta-analyses, um, and there to show that you've systematically um, included or excluded papers and how much started off and how much ended up and how much were excluded and why they're excluded. Um, but you can also get these kind of similar flowcharts talking about participant selection as well. Um, and you see them often in papers where they've you said at this stage this many were excluded because of this exclusion criteria and how much were followed up and these many dropped out or these many died and this is the final ones that are included for analysis so um it's called a prisma flowchart specifically when it's talking about meta-analyses systematic reviews but you can get very similar ones with primary research as well okay so now we're going to go on to our worked example so for anyone who didn't get the email with the paper here's a little qr code where you can get it um, I thought I'd go for a bit more of an interesting one rather than your boring kind of certain medicine X that you've never heard of for treating condition Y that you've never heard of. Um, this is a bit of a more of a fun one. We've got esports medicine. So let's go from our first step one. Um, if anyone's had a look at it already and is able to give me a pico of it, I'll be uh, very happy, very impressed. Otherwise, we'll work through it ourselves. Anyone had a look at this already and want to give it a go? Ah, that's okay. We'll, we'll go through it, we'll go through it. So this was a study looking at experienced male and female gamers that were 18 to 13, 30 years old. So we look at that, we can see that the, on their X inclusion criteria, I think from memory, they had to have a specific number of hours played, for instance. So that's how we can get their experience. We can see that they included male and female gamers and they had to be of a certain age. So we get that from their inclusion and exclusion criteria. And it's good that they've very clearly stated that. Our intervention, I wanna, I wanna have a go at the intervention. That's okay. So we have two interventions in this one because there are three different arms of our trial. So we have six minutes of a walking break after an hour of gaming or six minutes of a rest break. So not an active break after one hour of gaming and then a further hour of gaming after. And this is compared against no rest. So continuous gaming instead. And our outcomes. So our, here they very clearly stated their primary and secondary outcomes. So our primary outcome is the executive function changes in the players and secondary is the performance and the players perceptions of that break or intervention. Okay. And so obviously I stated before here, and as we'll do later, we want to make sure we know our measures of those outcomes as well to make sure that we're happy with them and they're, you know, quite val they're valid in terms of um, assessing them. So we're going to move forward to our type of study design. Can anyone tell me what study design was for this study? Uh, 
Any guesses? If I flip back a few slides, we look at the title, gives us a little clue. Any guesses? It's a randomized control trial. Amazing, amazing. How do you get it? Yeah, very good. So this is a randomized control trial, but quite specifically um, in it is it's a repeated measures randomized controlled trial. Um, so does anyone know what a repeated measures part, that part means of it? Any guesses? I want to know their thoughts on what repeated measures means as well for the study in terms of its validity. So repeated measures is when you have a group and they do intervention A, then they do intervention B, and then they do intervention C, for instance, in this one, we have three arms. So they do each of the different interventions. Um, and randomized means they can be randomized to which one they have first or in which order they have them. But all of, the, all of the participants do all the interventions. Can anyone think of any issues potentially with that? So I think one issue is uh, if you do one intervention after the other, um, if the sort of the time in between different interventions is not long enough, the, for example, if they have intervention A and then intervention B, the, the outcome measure from the intervention B might actually be um, a result of intervention A rather than intervention B, or in another case, uh, it could be the result of intervention B or and not the intervention A, but you have no way of telling uh, which way, which one it is if the sort of the interval between the two interventions is long enough to sort of clearly um, clear the effect as per se the of, of the intervention. Yeah, totally. So that, that is one um, downside of it as well. Um, for this study specifically, they're looking into questionnaires and things like that as well, and um, and different tests of executive function. And if you're having to do those tests multiple times, the first time you do it, you're probably gonna be a bit rubbish because you don't really get it. The other times you're gonna be a bit more familiar with it. And like the, by the last time you're gonna be a pro at this test. So reg regardless of the intervention, because you're getting better, you're more familiar with it. So um, it's called uh, order effects. That's the kind of bias that you get with things like this. Um, so it's, it's like saying, for instance, um, the infamous, situational judgment test. Um, while it's something that they say you can't really revise for, you can definitely practice at it. And um, I at least think that the more you practice at it, the more familiar with it, the, maybe the better you'll do, maybe marginally, but it, it will still improve your performance. And so that this is the same thing, regardless of whether you, I don't know, take a caffeine pill before your SJT, or if you um, somehow slip some um, amphetamines or something before your SJT, the fact that you've repeatedly done the SJT will definitely imp impact your performance on it. So that's always a worry with repeated measures. Um, but the fact of this one is, although there are um, three different interventions and they, they could be um, subject to um, this kind of order effect, there is a way that um, this study has counterbalanced that. So does anyone know maybe a way in theory that you could kind of counter the effects of something like um, repeated uh, order effects with something like this? You have three different interventions. You're probably gonna get better with each one. Does anyone know a way that you can maybe assign participants that means that maybe the overall results might be a bit more reflective? No, so with, with this one, um, they have done three, they've assigned the participants to three different groups and each group has a different order of doing each intervention. So the same amount of participants will have done A first, uh, the same amount of participants will have done intervention B first, and the same participants, uh, participants will have done intervention C first and second and third and all of that. So hopefully by the end, 
if you got better by the last study, then there'll be someone who has done intervention A for their last one, someone who's done B, someone who's done C. So your overall picture should be a bit more reflective. So they have made efforts to counterbalance this, although still repeated measures isn't the best. So then we look into the methodology. So this study has had consent and ethical approval, and they've stated that, so that's very good. We're happy with that. They've stated very clearly the patient, the participant demographics. They've stated how they've recruited them, and it's, in my opinion, appropriate in this situation. They've recruited them from um, places where gamers kind of hang out, so Discord, Twitch. Um, I think there's somewhere else where they said they use them from. Um, but basically, what places where you find gamers, they were looking for experienced gamers. This is the right place to, perfectly appropriate. Um, they've stated the number of participants that they recruited, and they've got a nice little flow diagram of the ones included, excluded, and involved in the final analysis. And they've, as I said before, they very clearly stated their inclusion and exclusion criteria. And I think that the ones that they used are very valid um, and they are good for assessing what they want to assess. Now, randomization, they've also stated how they've randomized all of their participants. Um, it doesn't matter too much really with this one because um, as long as they're just chucked in different groups because they're all doing each intervention anyway. Um, but in, if you're only doing one or the other, it's more important there. And they also have very clearly um, stated the uh, participants' demographics. But again, it doesn't really matter for the randomization in this particular study. This study is not blinded. Um, and so that definitely is a limitation of the study. But how you uh, blind someone that they're taking an active versus a uh, resting break and not taking a break, I have no idea. So I can't really um, get too annoyed at the authors of the study for that because I wouldn't know how to do that myself. Um, but it is something that might limit them. Uh, but however, another thing to add to this is one of the outcome measures was the participants' um, thoughts on how this affected them overall and just their, their, their views on things. And if you have, if they don't know what they're doing, then they might not be, they might not have a very clear view on how, uh, this, how they've enjoyed this thing. So the protocol, um, I think they've got a very clear protocol in this research. They very specifically stated the words that were being said to the uh, the participants and um, how things were done and to the times. And it was very, very clear, well-structured. They've tried to exclude lots of extraneous variables such as the participants' diets during it. Um, so it's, it's very, very clear with that. However, um, the participants, they're in their home setting. They're not in, for instance, a lab. So they could have, I don't know, throughout the game that they're playing, they could have a, um, a random cat walking across the screen for instance, um, and that could distract them, or they could have I don't know, their doorbell go off and that could distract them. And so it's not very well controlled um, for internal validity, but the fact that they're doing it in their own home where they'd normally be playing their games shows they have a good external validity and things like the computer setup and the game that was all standardized. Um, however, noted later is that um, the actual gameplay was real life gameplay. And so, you know, the other people they could be playing against might be better in certain players and things like that. So um, there is a lot of external validity, but um, they've tried to, to be as good with it, controlling extraneous, extraneous variables as they could um, with that. And lastly, um, the measures that they've used, they've used a load of standardized and validated surveys and tests to measure what they were looking for. Um, so I don't really have any problems with that. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm very happy with that. But they haven't got any biometric data, which might have been useful um, to look for things like um, kind of heart rate variability might be good and to look for maybe if they did, had eye tracking, for instance, they could look in concentrations. So they could have a bit more um, metrics and a bit more invasive metrics, maybe if they wanted to, to properly answer their question. But this is much more from a sort of COVID kind of era when they can have patients um, come into the lab and um, do things in real life like that. So they're kind of making do with what they could at the time. So that's our methodology critiques. Um, next, we move on to the statistics. statistics. Um, so this one is a bit more of a difficult one in terms of intention to treat or per protocol um, because they had people play the games and then they um, uploaded the data and then that was, that was basically it. It wasn't really following a treatment for a certain period of time. However, in our little flow diagram, 
it does state that certain uh, participants were not included in the analysis. Um, that's maybe because they didn't complete the, all of the different arms of the trial or they can upload their data. Um, so you could say that this, if you're picking between the two, this is more per protocol, the ones that were analyzed because those ones weren't included in the analysis, the ones that didn't complete all of them. Um, we can see very clearly they've got their power calculation that 20 participants would be enough to um, uh, for their outcome measures. And that, again, they stated an 80% likelihood with that. Um, and they had 21 participants, so I'm happy with that. And they very clearly stated that the significance of the study was set to a p-value of less than 0 0.05, which I'm also very happy with. So they've been all very good with their statistics there. And they've also um, explained how they're going to be including their statistical analysis to so the program they're using. And so it's all very kind of replicable. So if I was to use the same system and analyze all the data, given the raw data, then I could come up with the same kind of values, for the p-values and the means and everything like that. So all very nice, very clear, very transparent. So next we move on to the results. Um, so have they reported all the outcomes? I think they have reported all the outcomes. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and they also haven't lied about some of them being significant when the p-value is, if, it, if it's over 0 0.05, they quite um, clearly stated this wasn't significant or there weren't significant differences found in these things. So I was happy with that. The demographics were reported. We've got a nice long list and something that um, you should do is obviously look through all of this as well. Um, I think they were looking for maybe was gender differences. And if you look quite clearly at their kind of report of all of them, most of them males versus females were fairly well balanced. However, um, you, there's a quite significant difference in the hours played weekly in the men versus the women. So therefore the men probably are more likely to be more experienced and maybe that might have, an, might have an impact in your analysis later on. So little things like that you can pick up on and you can see. Okay. And then lastly, they don't really report confidence intervals on here. They have, they have the range of values. So that kind of changes things slightly. I would have maybe quite liked some confidence intervals, but um, we'll stick with ranges for here. And lastly, we spoke about dropouts. Um, you know, we've got nine that didn't complete it, I think, or eight. And they've stated why um, and why they haven't been involved in the analysis. So we have a nice mixture of things that promote external validity and uh, some things that uh, promote internal validity here. Um, I think this probably was aimed to be something that would be done in the lab with high internal validity. But then COVID happened, they had to adapt things, really. So lastly, we're critiquing our discussion conclusion. I don't think they overplayed um, insignificant results. However, they did in, in the discussion start talking about physical health and how exercise, you know, a break might be good for physical health um, and kind of almost kind of sneak, sneak that into their conclusion, but they didn't examine any of those parameters. So be wary of that. This, isn't, this study isn't coming to any conclusion about uh, this break being good for your physical health, although a break after an hour is very good. We know from other studies. Um, they've stated all their limitations very well. They've been very frank about them. Uh, which is very good, very honest. I couldn't come up with too many more limitations that they had, uh, except maybe the sample size, even though the power calculation was 80% with that sample size, I think anything that's reporting sample size of 20 isn't could do better, really. Um, and I think their conclusions are quite valid, really. Um, and lastly, none of the authors, they, none of them declared any conflicts of interest. If I was going to go really deep dive into really critiquing the paper. I could Google all of the, um, the authors and I could look for myself if, um, if there's anything on there, uh, but you'd hope that um, all honest authors would report their conflicts of interest, which most do. And lastly, we've got to summarize. So um, as I said before, my, if I was saying this from my point of view with the strengths and limitations, I could say that this one does have quite a high element of external validity in it. Um, I think they've been very clear with their methodology. I think they've got, um, they've be definitely done their best of what you could do in a COVID scenario to try and standardize things. Um, and that was good. Limitations, I thought, um, all of the ones they basically said in the paper, um, they were talking about, um, again, not having that kind of internal validity side of things as much. Um, and I don't yeah, basically agree with all of those and all the things we've said so far, you know, the repeated measures, all of that kind of thing. 
would it change my practice? So would I be advising every esports gamer to take a six minute break? I would from a health point of view, but in terms of improving their performance, this study has shown that it won't necessarily improve their gaming performance, but it will improve their executive function. So what I would want to know going forward in a lab setting, would this improve their performance? And also, um, is there a very clear link, a studied link between um, improved executive function and improved gaming performance? Because this is not something that they've specifically stated. So if you can prove that um, gay, the rest improve your executive function, then you can assume that it would improve performance in further studies. So I'd want this repeated in bigger samples. I'd want it, some more internal validity. And then you can then say, oh, maybe if there's a difference, if I adjust the brakes, will it work? So these are kind of the steps that you take to kind of taking and, and critically appraising a paper as kind of a whistle stop tool. Um, and kind of uh, rush through kind of a specific example of a paper, but I do recommend you going and looking through similar papers or even this paper and seeing what you make of it yourself if you haven't already um, and seeing if you come to the same conclusions as me. And if you don't, I'd love to know. Um, I'd love to know if there's anything else that you think they could have done better as well or anything they could have done different, any strengths um, and what you would take away from this. But um, these kind of steps are really the cornerstone of critical appraisal. And another thing I like to do also when I'm critically appraising an article is not only have these steps in my mind, but also there are lots of checklists online that you can use to um, follow for different types of studies. So one I would recommend is CASP, it's C-A-S-P. They have lots of different checklists on the critical appraisal of different articles, and it's always helpful just to look through it um, to remind yourself of the things you should be looking for. Um, Prisma has also got a very good one when you're looking for things for systematic reviews and the, you get like a nice little score at the end as well. So thank you very much for listening. I know I've almost run a bit over, but has anyone got any questions? Must have done a very good job then, can't complain. <laughs> no questions at all? I'll, I'll take that. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for the human. That was really brilliant. Brilliant. Thanks very much. No problem. Um, don't forget to fill in the feedback form. Always